Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Raj Reddy, and I would like to welcome you to the Restoring Voting Rights and Safeguarding Democracy opt-in event, which is brought to you by Lewis and Clark Law School's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and also supported by Lewis and Clark's College's Umbrella Committee on Equity and Inclusion. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who helped make this event possible and extend a special thanks to Henry Van Buren and Tess Jacobson for their technical and event support. As we know, the right to vote represents the lifeblood of American democracy, but even at the nation's founding, this right was not extended to all people and in all cases. And even when this grave wrong was righted by the passages of the 15th and 19th Amendments, forces in our country were already hard at work to undermine this most basic democratic guarantee, whether through voter intimidation, poll taxes, literary tests, or otherwise. And although the tactics have evolved, vulnerable minorities are still being disenfranchised today. Here with us to discuss the landscape of voter suppression both historically and today is ACLU attorney Molly McGrath, a champion in the effort to restore voting rights broadly as well as in one of this year's battleground states of Wisconsin. Molly is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin School of Law and has been featured on CNN, New York Times, The Today Show, and more. And she's also the host of the voting rights podcast at the polls. Molly will be speaking for 40 to 45 minutes, at which point we will hold a Q&A. Please feel free at any point to submit questions through the Q&A feature, but please note that this event is being recorded, and so too may any submitted questions. Um, with that said, Molly, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us on this incredibly timely and important topic. Thank you, Professor Reddy. Thank you all so much. Thank you for having me. Um, we'll take a, you know, a journey to, uh, through the history of voter suppression, which, you know, as Professor Reddy talked about, we really can't look at what's happening today without a full context of the very ugly and scarring history that we have in this country and the cycles that we go through and why we have this, why we have these laws that are inherently racist. And then we'll take a take a fast forward to to some of of the some of the things that we see now and a deep dive into some of these stories and the real folks you know impacted that these these are more than statistics these are more than the the turnout margin in the election but these are individuals our our neighbors our our friends family members who have rights and we'll hear from some of them and hear their stories and then we'll we'll talk about uh what this this very not normal election that we are <laughs> experiencing um, and 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 going through right now and what what some of the suppression and what some of uh, these changes and laws look like and what we can expect uh, this year and absolutely want to you know we'll have time to answer questions and leave that open uh, as well. So I am going to share my screen with you all and success. Can you all see my screen? Okay, awesome. Um, so as Professor Reddy said that this, we, thinking of who first had the right to vote in this country was strictly limited to white, wealthy, land-owning men. And not until Reconstruction and the, the 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment granting citizenship and ensuring that no states can deny the right to vote based on race, it wasn't until then that we, that we even saw Black men with the right to vote. And, and it worked, right? If, if you let people vote, they vote. And so what did we see? We saw, you know, significant increases in in black voter turnout and black voter registration. At one point, Mississippi had a 90% registration rate. And also two, and they, and they had black senators. So there was representation and there was access. And so what happened? We saw backlash. We saw the rise of voter intimidation tactics, the KKK. We saw poll taxes. We saw literacy tests. And all of these as ways to deter Black voters and to target Black voters, particularly who didn't have, as coming from Reconstruction and, and slavery, did not have the economic means to, to pay the poll tax in the same way that the white counterparts would. And so if you look at even just after after these suppression and this, these tactics are put into place, you see the decrease, right? Voter suppression works. That's why they do it. And 
with these literacy tests, with these Jim Crow laws, we saw the decrease from 1896 to ushering in these horrific tactics from 130,000 black registrants to roughly 5,000 two years later. Similarly, in Mississippi, to go from a 90% registration rate amongst black men to 6%. And so it's that backdrop, knowing that, knowing that these tactics work, knowing that targeted voter suppression works and that it's inherently trying to stop black people from voting, that is the history that, that we come to. And the, in addition to these, these Jim Crow laws, we also saw the birth of stripping citizens of their right to vote. So if you look at, this map, which uh, is, has a few updates because we have, we have some good news here in Iowa uh, with an executive order and Virginia and Kentucky that folks are able to vote, even the folks who have been convicted of a felony this year. But these laws are all rooted in Jim Crow racist laws. So if somebody is impacted by the criminal justice system and convicted of a felony, all of these states, except Maine or Vermont, take away somebody's right to vote. And how did that all start? Well, look at, look at Florida, for example. So you have 1865, the 13th Amendment is passed. You know, we're, we're ending slavery, slavery, we're ending race-based voting restrictions. And then we're also, though, finding ways to stop black people from voting and that's by felon disenfranchisement laws. So these were ushered in as a method to strip black people of their right to vote. And some of them continue to exist today in state constitutions. In Florida, this was a part of the state constitution impacting roughly 1.6, 1.4 million people. And only through the passage of a, a constitutional amendment in 2018 was this changed. This is still part of Iowa's constitution. This is still part of Kentucky's constitution and has changed with executive orders this year, but this is still part of our, part of the, part of our history that's rooted in racism and disproportionately to this day impacts people of color. So looking at all of these states, there's still work to do. Even some of these states allow, allow folks to vote once they are off paper, once they are released from incarceration, but they're, all of these are rooted in, 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 in a racist history. So what, what, happens, what happens next? We have, we have organizing, we have an I, I uh, you know, we could have a, a whole series on, on the civil rights movement and the work, the sacrifice that the organizing that got us to the Voting Rights Act, but knowing the giants that that organized that marched that uh, you know were beaten and and bloodied when we think of John Lewis and the pictures of of him in in the streets uh, being being beaten because of wanting the right to vote because of demanding this change and the right to vote that it was only through you know this racist history and all of this organizing and progress that something like the Voting Rights Act could even happen. And looking at the late 1890s until 1964, that this change didn't happen overnight, that this was only the product of, of organizing sacrifice and determination to 1965, when we have the Voting Rights Act. And, you know, particularly the main, one of the main sections of the Voting Rights Act, you know, essentially looked at all of these jurisdictions, all of these places that had a history of discrimination and laws that race, discriminated on race and voting laws that would be discriminatory towards people of color. If, if they had laws like that in place, essentially they would have to ask the federal government for permission before changing their laws because they couldn't be trusted, right? Like they were on notice that like, we know, we know what you're doing. You know, we, we, see, we see these tactics, we know they work and you can't be trusted to pass new laws that are going to, because we think it's going to continue to impact and discriminate against people of color. And so you're going to have to check with the Department of Justice uh, before doing that. And so that, that was you know, one of the, the biggest civil rights piece of legislation that, 
that we've seen. And so that happened and that was passed in 1965 and originally it was set to have, you know, five years that it would, it would, uh, it would be uh, in place for five years. And what did we see through, through modern history? We saw continual reauthorizations. So, and across the board. So this is, you know, Reagan giving a 25 year extension in 1982. And this is, you know, uh, you know, almost a no brainer in Congress. This is passing not controversial common sense, right? Like voting rights are for all Americans. We have got to protect this precious sacred right. And of course we can all agree about this despite our politics. That's what we saw in 1982 with the 25 year extension. George W. Bush in 2006, and then we had 2008, and we had the one of the biggest turnout we've seen in election in an election, and we saw the birth of what you know now we hear so many pundits call the Obama coalition. Right? We hear we hear about this, and who who turned out to vote and who got a, you know, a black man elected president? What did this look like? This is a historic groundbreaking moment in our country and how did it happen? And we, we saw the importance of people of color and people of color, black voters having access to the ballot box, young people. What does this look like? This looks like democracy to me, but to others, it looks like something that needs to change. And so what did we see? We saw now, just as we did after Reconstruction, at the pendulum swing and a modern day version of Jim Crow and a lot of these tactics. So we saw, we saw 2008 and then we saw 2013, which was, you know, the, the kind of death of that key part of the Voting Rights Act that required permission. And so Shelby versus Holder was the case that the Supreme Court decided in 2013 and essentially this kind of really demobilized that permission slip, you know, for those jurisdictions that, you know, uh, misbehaved because they were passing racist laws, they had that history of racial discrimination. Now, they could do whatever they wanted. It was, you know, it was, it was a, uh, a free for all, right? They didn't have to check with the DOJ. And the reasoning was, was that, you know, we, we, we don't need that anymore, essentially. And there's, uh, you know, this is uh, a very hard dissent to talk about now after the passing um, of, of, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg, but there, um, you know, she had a very famous dissent that I'm sure many of you have read, um, already, but she said, you know, throwing out this preclearance requirement, um, you know, at this time is to stop this racial discrimination, you know, when it's worked is like getting rid of your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. And so the fact that it's there um, was, was because it was needed. And, you know, there was no way to demonstrate the opposite except what we're living through now. So here is a map from the Brennan Center. So combined with the 2000, combined with what we saw with the 2008 election, enter in 2010, and we saw a lot of backlash to this, you know, huge Democratic coalition in state houses across the country. A lot of now uh, different state houses had Republican-led governorships in that 2010 midterm and state houses, including here in Wisconsin. And then we also saw the, the end of this preclearance requirement. And so what we saw from 2010 on with those two things, we've seen 25 states pass laws restricting the right to vote. So this doesn't just look like a poll test. This doesn't look like uh, you're, this is no longer, you know, a poll tax or a literacy test. Now it looks like voter purges. It looks like cuts to early vote. It looks like strict photo ID laws. And so some of these states were states that were covered by, uh, you know, by Shelby and no longer needed permission. And some were states that uh, you know, had, were part of that pendulum swing like Wisconsin um, after the 2008 election. So what does some of these laws look like and who do they impact? 
Well, photo, photo ID laws, we will, you know, talk about more, but one, uh, one uh, specific demographic targeted here are young voters. And if you think of a state like Texas, that it was like the next day or so they had, they had their photo ID law ready. And the next day or so after Shelby, it was, um, you know, moving forward that folks were ready to do this. And one of the, you know, one of the kickers of the Texas law is that it lets folks vote and, you know, show up with a concealed carry permit, but not a student ID from the University of Texas. So the way some of these really strict photo ID laws work is you either have one of these IDs to vote and you're able to vote and get that regular ballot, or you show up and you don't have that ID and you, you aren't allowed to. So, you know, really demonstrating in, in Texas who, who they're trying to include and, and who they're not. We also see photo ID, we also see uh, restrictions that target uh, indigenous populations. When we look at North Dakota had an ID law, as an ID law that would have uh, required the address to match. And we think of tribal, in, tribal voters, think of Indian country where post offices are often used, not street addresses, where mail is a little different and making a little, delivered a little, uh, differently and it's a little more complicated based off of the street addresses in Indian country and, and who is specifically targeted by the way these laws are written. We also know that, you know, both based off of our history and now even modern day samples that voter suppression is specifically working toward suppressing the vote of black voters. And this is a uh, piece of uh, piece of evidence actually from uh, a, a case that we did here that my colleagues did here at the ACLU on the on the photo ID law in North Carolina and you know specifically asking uh, you know the percent of those folks with this ID who were African American and so later the the judge in this case said that this law targeted black voters with surgical precision and that wasn't a mistake. That's not a bug. That's a feature and the intent of a lot of these laws. So I want to talk a little bit about how these look on the ground. So we, you know, we know who's targeted. We, 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 we see the laws. We hear, you know, about voter purges, about strict ID laws. But how does how does it look? And so, you know, just thinking of, you know, we saw the map and the, the, the national scale here and all of these laws, you know, uniquely in, in different states, we're just going to look at one state right now, just looking at one state and one law, just to give a, just to give a flavor of what this looks like, let alone, you know, the, the, the amount of suppression scaled up at a national level. So this uh, gentleman, his name is Alfonso, and this is in Wisconsin. So after 2010, uh, Wisconsin passed one of the strictest photo ID laws in the country. So you either had an ID on this you know, specific list of IDs and you voted a regular ballot or you didn't. And these IDs were you know, drafted in the legislation by the legislature. And if you, if you show up with one, you're, you vote a regular ballot. If you don't, you're forced to vote a provisional ballot. And you can only get that ballot counted if you produce one of these, you know, special IDs by the Friday after the election at four o'clock. And so, you know, we, the ACLU immediately sued over this. And also at the same time with the ACLU, I've, I've been helping folks to make sure that they know about this law and can comply with it. And so this is Alfonso, one of the very first people who I met. And we were at a registration drive at his high school in the, in the lobby uh, of, of his high school. And he came up to the table with a lot of his friends and they were all you know, lining up and uh, excited to register to vote. And this was before a, uh, this was actually in 2016 before the primary election. And 
um, he sat down and registered and I said, do you have a, uh, you know, Wisconsin state ID or Wisconsin driver's license? He said, no, you know, he didn't, he didn't drive. And, you know, I asked him about a few of the other IDs on the list, a passport, you know, he wasn't in college yet. So we wouldn't have, you know, these student IDs that, you know, that, that could have worked. Um, and he didn't have, uh, you know, a, a tribal ID, military ID, veterans ID, you know, no, none of those would he didn't have any of those. And so I said, okay, well, you know, there's, you can go to the DMV and get an ID. And I gave him, you know, a piece of paper that described what he would need to take to, to the DMV to, to get an ID. And he just kind of looked at it, said, okay. And then I watched him turn the corner um, to, to, to go toward his locker. And I kind of looked around to see what he was going to do. And I saw him uh, throw the piece of paper away. And so I went after him and I said, hey, you know, this looks super, you know, super confusing. Don't worry. Like I can, I can go with you, um, you know, to the DMV. And he said, yeah, you know, I don't drive, you know, and I have an after school program. It would take me two different buses to get to the DMV. And also my birth certificate is at my mom's house. You know, that's across town. And I don't know where my social security card is. And I said, no worries at all. You know, we will, we'll figure this out. I'm going to message you. And so, you know, we started, uh, you know, messaging on, I think Facebook or Snapchat or whatever, <laughs> whatever was uh, the, whatever was in the zeitgeist um, at that time. And that's, and you worked through the process to, you know, step-by-step, step, what is it going to, you know, what is it that he would need? And for me, you know, I learned a lot as an organizer that day because I learned that, you know, that this was not just a burden on voters. Clearly, this is a burden on voters. But as organizers and as voting rights advocates, this is also a burden because in order to get somebody to register to, vote, you know, ready to vote, you know, registering wasn't enough. You know, we, we worked through that together, but now there was this whole other step in the process before, um, you know, before Alfonso was, was, was going to vote and, and that that, you know, that was a, a burden on, on all of or, all of these organizers as well, you know, and, and especially on the voter. And, you know, the other, the other lesson that I learned, um, you know, and really my, you know, one of my first experiences working with someone one-on-one -on -one here like this was, I think the, you know, I think the most dangerous, which is what, what is the long-term signal that these laws send, you know, and I saw it right? Like I, I saw it, Alfonso sat down with his friends and his friends registered to vote, you know, when they were asked about their ID, they, they had that. And for Alfonso, you know, he, he didn't have that. And that just sent the signal that, hey, you know, this isn't for you, you know, this democracy, this, you know, you don't have what you need, you're not, you're not invited. And, you know, I, as he, as I saw him, you know, turn the corner and throw that piece of paper away um, because of these additional hoops that he would have been forced, you know, that he was forced to go through uh, in, in order to vote. This is Gladys. Um, so this is Gladys at her, at her uh, home. She lives on the north side of Milwaukee. Um, I, many people know Milwaukee is a very segregated uh, city and she lives on the north side and she uh, you know, lives in a, in a two, four flat with her, with her, uh, husband, Richard. And I first met Gladys after the, uh, 20, 2016 election. So this is actually a photo was taken in February, 2017. And it was, uh, it was actually during, uh, you know, black history month. And I, I was, uh, talking with Gladys about her voting experience when she tried to vote a, in the presidential election in 2016. And that would have been the year, the very first year that this, that this law was in place in Wisconsin statewide. It was, like we said, it was passed in 2010 in that wave of restrictions, but it wasn't in place statewide because of litigation um, until 2016. And so this is what, this is, this is what we saw of the effect of it. So what Gladys is holding there is, um, you can see at the top, it's called her goal pass. And you can also see her, her name and photo. And what that is, is a government issued photo ID. 
It's a, issued by the city or county of Milwaukee, uh, and and it's a bus pass with her name and photo. So if she, what she's holding is a government issued photo ID that is commonly used in Milwaukee, um, where you know eighty percent of the black population lives in Wisconsin and you know by folks who use public transportation and that's what gladys took when she tried to vote in 2016 and she did not have a wisconsin id she didn't have a driver's license she didn't have any passport military id any of these other ids on that list and she went to vote with her walker you know walking around the corner to the school where she's been voting for decades in wisconsin and because of this law and not having one of those IDs, uh, you know, her vote did not count. And so when we, uh, you know, when we think of how, how these laws are curated and what we saw in North Carolina and, you know, wh what we see is they, they are curated to make sure that certain people are excluded, um, you know, from the system. And so here she is with uh, you know, with what she took. She also had other things like her social security card, um, you know, a, a Medicaid card, so many other pieces of identification. Um, but she, uh, you know, was one of the people in 2016 whose, whose voice was not heard and who, you know, did not contribute to the decision of the future of this country. Um, this last one is Ruby. So the good news is, is Ruby was able to vote. And, you know, the interesting thing about her story is, is that really through litigation only was, was Ruby able to vote. Essentially what, what the court here in Wisconsin said, and, you know, also now, you know, the Seventh Circuit on appeal is that if Wisconsin is going to have this very strict law where you you have one of these IDs or you don't, you have to have some sort of safety net, right? And that safety net, especially for people like Ruby. So Ruby was born, um, she's in, in Arkansas by midwife in the, I can't remember, the 30s or 40s though, um, 20s, I can't remember. Uh, but she never had a birth certificate. And so if she didn't have all of the underlying documents to go and get an ID so she could vote. So she wanted to vote, she, uh, had had other forms of identification, but she didn't have all of the identification needed to get a Wisconsin ID so she could vote. And she tried at the DMV several different times and was 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 turned away because she didn't have all of the documentation. And so through litigation, the safety net was was put in place that said if you don't have all of the documents that you need to vote, you can still get something, a credential at the DMV to vote. And so this was uh, uh, on an election weekend uh, one year, and here she is before um, the, you know, the Sunday or so before, and, you know, happy that she was able to actually get this uh, credential that she could use to vote. Um, and this all sets the backdrop for where we are now, right? So we have, you know, this wave of some of, uh, some of these very restrictive laws. We have, you know, we see the impact in just one state and what that can look like. And then now we are, you know, in, in, in the spring, uh, in the middle of a pandemic. And what, what does that look like? Well, I think we were all haunted uh, and continue to be by what we saw in Milwaukee, the hours long lines, um, you know, a, a city where there was traditionally 180 polling locations, uh, you know, down to, down to five during the primary. And then even just a few, a few months later saw, saw similar lines in, in Georgia. And so what does what does this look like? Well, this means you know on top of on top of uh, making sure that everybody is able to vote despite restrictive laws, we also have you know a new mandate that we're working on to make sure that everybody can vote in the midst of a pandemic as well, and that we're not you know working to make sure that we're not going to see something like this uh, again in in the fall. 
And another great thing, I, I, I think you know, this, this picture really went all over. The, another fun fact about this picture is it was actually taken by an intern for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, who's now on staff now, but obviously um, someone incredibly talented. And take your internship seriously, I guess, is the other, the other moral of that story. Um, so here's some of the work just even here um, that we've done at the ACLU. So all of the pink states here are states where, um, you know, the, the, the legal team at the ACLU has filed litigation. I think it's up to 24 different cases since the COVID pandemic. We've also done advocacy campaigns in all of the states uh, as well with, with arrows on them. Um, and so what does some of this look like? Well, basically, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, all of our work is really founded in the belief that no one should have to choose between their health and the right to vote, period. And what does that look like to make it as accessible as possible? Really goes into you know, two different buckets. One, to make sure that folks who want to vote by mail have the option to vote by mail. And knowing that, there were, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, 16, 16 different states who still required an excuse for voters to vote by mail. So thinking of Texas, right? Like you have to be, you know, out of the county over a certain age. You know, that's what some of these excuses looked like, you know, out of the jurisdiction on election day, you know, you had to fit these criteria. It wasn't open to everybody who chose to vote that way. And, you know, since then, not just through litigation, through different methods, we have seen four, this is down to, I think, four or five states only are still requiring an excuse. So, you know, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us a few things. One, that, you know, these, these sort of laws are outdated, you know, during the best of times, and they're just, you know, almost dangerous during COVID. And so we, you know, we certainly have work to do. And I'm thinking, you know, even here in Delaware, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I live in a blue state, there's, there's nothing to do here, we don't have voter suppression. Well, even a state like Delaware, um, you know, still required a legislative campaign. This is still in the constitution an excuse requirement. So there's always, you know, work that we can do. And, you know, through the legislature, they passed a law um, this year to, to, to get rid of the excuse requirement, but, you know, really demonstrates that there's always work to do to make voting more expansive. And then also shows that this is, you know, uh, a common sense policy. I mean, we saw states across the board, you know, uh, you know, executive orders in, you know, uh, in different states, red states, blue states, that this just, you know, made sense. Um, and a lot of a lot of movement there. The second, uh, the second kind of way that we've looked at our, our, you know, the COVID, COVID work and making sure that voting is as accessible as possible in the middle of a pandemic is making sure that there are adequate in-person locations. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, I would get a few calls from folks and say, you know, Molly, this, shouldn't we just do all, like all vote by mail, like only mail in ballots, that's it. And, you know, the answer is actually no, we shouldn't do that. And that it is essential to have, you know, adequate in-person polling locations that are also, you know, adequately staffed, adequate PPE as well, and able to socially distance. And, you know, this is essential, not just for folks who choose to vote, in person, but also essential for some of our most marginalized communities. So voters with disabilities who uh, want to vote and need to vote on an accessible machine. We think back to tribal communities where the mail can mail delivery can be a little more complicated and we want to make sure that there's adequate in person options. Um, you know, folks who want uh, folks who require language assistance, you know, and then we also see traditions like souls to the polls in the black community that is in person voting on the Sunday before election. And so we want to ensure that all of those options are are preserved. Um, and so we have, you know, in some of this work done early vote work. So in a state like Florida, we have, we have done campaigns even down to not just the state level, but right now at the county level, targeting supervisors of elections in counties. These are the elected officials who are the head of elections in those counties and have a lot of power in determining how those elections are run. So that state requires eight days of early vote, but it can have two weeks in each county. And that's up to the supervisor of elections. 
So we activated, you know, our membership, our, our coalition members to our voters, you know, and in those counties to demand action from their supervisors of elections that they're going to have those full two weeks, um, you know, especially during a pandemic. So folks can vote in a way that's socially distanced and folks who uh, want to vote that way for the reasons we talked about have that as an option. And we've seen victories there in Seminole County, in Pinellas, in Fallujah on some of that in-person early voting. And then even states that, that you know, had a, uh, you know, didn't have an excuse requirement, you know, let's, what can we do to even right now make voting more accessible? And so a state like Nevada to, you know, every, anybody could vote by mail there, but how can we, you know, find an opportunity to push this even farther and make it more accessible? and led a legislative campaign there to not just mail voters, you know, uh, 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 application, but, but a ballot. How can we get a ballot into registered voters' hands in the most seamless way as possible, since we're seeing that, you know, a large increase of people are wanting to vote by mail as their method this year. So that's what a lot of the, uh, a lot of the kind of post, you know, unique, unique work looks like um, in, in the middle of a pandemic. And then even some of the, some of the litigation has also looked at requirements like the witness requirement or notary requirement in states. So on, on uh, our, our election system, as we know, is so decentralized and different from state to state and states have the, the power to make those requirements different. And so, um, you know, getting rid of some states, uh, I'm thinking, I think we just got a, a win from Alabama just this afternoon, um, but to get rid of, you know, a witness requirement that is just extra difficult, a huge burden, especially in the middle of a pandemic. And, you know, we heard, we heard from an election administrator in Virginia who said, you know, we're, we're checking security other ways, um, you know, not, not through the witness uh, not through the witness requirements. So something that is a, a needless hoop that doesn't provide any more security uh, at all. And so a few, uh, you know, kind of hot, hot kind of frequent questions that we get here is one that I'm getting that I'm guessing a lot of folks are getting is you know, how do I vote by mail this year? We're hearing an increase of people all over the country that picking that for, for their way to vote this year. And we want to make sure that with seeing more vote by mail than ever before, that we are providing folks with, with what they need to vote by mail. And so if you go to aclu.org slash voter, we have a 50 state guide to make sure that folks know what those deadlines are in that state, where they can request a ballot. Some states have online. We wish everybody could do it online, but that's not the case. So whatever it is for that, for your state, we have it all in one place. So if you get a call from a uh, you know, friend, family, X, whoever it is, we have the answer, share this tool with them. And we also wanna make sure that, we, that we're making this plan as soon as possible. So we wanna make sure that folks are voting as soon as possible, whether that's uh, choosing to vote by mail or in person to do it early and make that plan early. So that's you know, one thing that's really, you know, I say this is, it's really all hands on deck moment right now. And that's to flatten the curve and make sure that we are all voting as early as possible. And so we are the best ourselves. You all are the best resources for, for, for your friends, for your family, uh, as a, you know, as yourself, a trusted resource. And so that's how it's most effective is us ourselves talking with our friends and family. And so that's, you know, that's really up to all of us to not just make sure that we are making our plan right now, but that we are sharing tools that we are making sure that people are not waiting till the last minute, but are making their plan to vote right now. Um, if you know you haven't already and a lot of people I think closer to a million already have. Um, another question that we get a lot right now is about the USPS. Um, what you know what can we what's going on with the USPS essentially is you know is the question that we're getting and we you know at the ACLU have started you know this podcast and a video uh, you know three minute video series all of these minis to answer all of these frequently asked questions that we're getting a lot and so um, one is on the USPS and you know there's there's no mistake that you know we're seeing the attacks on the USPS um, we 
people ask if I'm, if I'm surprised um, by some of the work that I'm doing now. And I guess the answer is yes, because I never would think that I would be, you know, having to defend against some of our most beloved institutions um, and the things that, you know, are, that we are all proud of as, you know, as Americans, including, you know, especially in including the USPS. Um, but a few things. So one, you know, we can have faith in the USPS. So looking at the amount of, of, of mail that they get, you know, every single year during the holiday season compared to what would happen during the election, they are absolutely ready and equipped to handle what will happen and what is happening during this election cycle. Second, you know, I, I, I know that coming out of, you know, uh, in the Pacific Northwest coming out of Washington, you all probably saw, uh, you know, a great court decision that's, you know, put a stop to any further changes by DeJoy at the USPS between now and the election because of recognizing the political motivations there. And then third, and I can drop the link in the chat later, but, you know, through, uh, you know, through, through our conversations and answering this, I talked to a woman named Joy, and she has been with the USPS for 30 some years. And I asked her, like, what does this look like, you know, on the ground? And, you know, she talked about it and she, you know, absolutely said, you know, we can handle the holidays, we can handle this. And the one thing, um, you know, that she said that really struck out to me, um, you know, she asked that, you know, we all vote early, of course, you know, make your plan now. But she, she said, you know, we at the USPS, we're going to do our job and you all do yours and vote. Um, and, you know, really the, the, the folks who work for these institutions, the folks who, you know, are on the ground working for the USPS, you know, they, they have our back and, you know, we need to have theirs by voting and then also, you know, continuing our advocacy through Congress, uh, you know, through now through the Senate to ensure that full, uh, full funding for a fully functioning post office is going to be uh, a priority. Um, the, the last kind of frequently asked question that I get a lot before I turn it over is what's election night going to look like this year? What, what's going to happen essentially? Um, and we talked to, you know, both an expert and then I, I talked to a clerk here in Wisconsin. Um, you know, I'm in Wisconsin now. And this is, I think, as we've all seen in different news reporting, you know, going to be a pivotal state here and determinative toward the outcome of of the election and, and electoral votes. And so what is election night going to look like? Well, what do we know? We know that we're going to see, uh, you know, more vote by mail than ever before. You know, more people can vote by mail than ever before and more people are. And especially in a state like Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania, three, three big states that we hear about, we, you know, in Wisconsin, we, we traditionally have a culture of in-person voting where, you know, we're not like, uh, you know, like Colorado or Utah or Oregon, where it's primarily a vote by mail state. We have a very heavy, you know, very strong culture of voting in person. And so with this shift means the way our election administration also shifts. And in our state, along with Michigan and Pennsylvania, we are election administrators by statute, and these are, you know, at the state level, cannot start processing ballots until election day. So our, you know, poll workers, election administrators can't start processing those ballots until election day. And what does that look like? Well, if somebody votes in person, you know, you, we have same day registration. So you come in, you're either on the books or you can register with the right credentials on election day, you know, show that, you know, stupid photo ID that we talked about, you know, show that ID and then, and then you vote and you yourself put the ballot in the machine and, you know, that's, that's processed. Now with, with absentee ballots, it's a little different, right? Because these are in envelopes, so they, they need to be checked for the specific requirements in that state. So for instance, in Wisconsin, that's checked for the voter signature. It's not a signature match, but the voter still needs to sign it. And there's also a witness requirement. So it's making sure that that witness signature is there and the witness's address. So those all have to be checked, right? Um, and there's also a check for eligibility that the clerk does. So all of that, all of those, you know, checks on, 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 on the process itself that always happen, those, those still occur, but not until election day. And then there's the actual, you know, manual labor of opening the envelope, 
unfolding the ballot and putting it in the machine. All of these things that happen, uh, you know, in uh, with with the help of the voter, right, on election day. And so when we're looking at substantially more ballots in these states and, and not counting these ballots until election day, that just means it's going to take more time, right? And that's what the election administrators are doing. And when it's taking time, that's them doing their job. And so what this can look like on election night might mean that we're going to see the results of in-person voting sooner. And I think you all might have noticed that there's somebody who's attacking vote by mail, and a lot of people who will vote for that person aren't voting in, by mail according to polling as much or by absentee as much as some of this in-person voting. So we could see a, a totally different uh, you know, a totally different lead in numbers based on this in-person voting as we would once all the ballots are counted. So it's essential for all of us to be patient for the media, for, um, you know, for, for everyone to be patient, understand what, what the process happening and taking time is the process, you know, actually working. Um, you know, some states like Florida will be processing this earlier and will likely have a result, um, you know, from Florida that night. And you know, understanding what this process looks like, why each state has has a different process, and why this process is going to take longer. I think in Michigan they've said it won't they won't have results for. Um, I think at least the next morning, I, I, if, if not a little later, um, the clerk here, you know, in Wisconsin, I think in Milwaukee said, you know, don't expect anything till Wednesday morning at the earliest. And so um, we, you know, we all need to understand what, what this is going to look like and why it's looking um, a little different and that a lot of this is just our, our, our process working as it should. And, um, you know, kind of some, uh, some advice, like, just like in junior high, right, just because somebody's a winner doesn't mean they're the winner, right? And so <laughs> that's, that's what election night is going to be like, just because somebody declares, um, you know, that they're the winner, they're not the winner until the votes are in. Um, so I think we have, yeah, 15 minutes or so. I'll turn it to you, Professor Reddy, if there's uh, questions here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, thank you so much, Molly, for that wonderful and informative presentation. Um, I'm going to let some of the, the questions come in through the Q&A function. So um, folks, if you have a question, please feel free to ask it. Um, I've got um, at least a couple here um, of my own while those trickle in. Um, I'm curious, you know, here in Oregon, we, yeah, we generally just all vote by mail. And I'm curious for some of these polling places that are going to be so reduced in numbers, um, what is sort of the process of keeping them open? Let's just say if it's past midnight mm. and the lines are still as long, if not longer than that image that you showed us because there are so, uh, so many fewer of them. Does that happen through a judge's order or a state statute? That's a great question. So I think, um, you know, two things. So one is the, you know, one of the reasons that we saw a lot of lines in Wisconsin and in different places was and in Georgia was lack of poll workers. So when we think the average age of a poll worker, I think is six, you know, late 60s, and we think of who's impacted by COVID, right? Poll workers rightfully were prioritizing their health over that, over that job, but that meant we were in a shortage of poll workers, and so we could not adequately staff polling locations, and that caused closure of polling locations or significant slowdowns. So, you know, one thing that we, you know, are seeing across the country is young people stepping up to, you know, really run our democracy in a time when we absolutely need it because of, you know, who is more predisposed or not to catching COVID and who is more significantly impacted. So part of it is, you know, making sure that, um, you know, that we have, you know, like the PPE and every, and the people to adequately staff enough of these polling locations. And then another part is, you know, making sure that everybody knows that if they are in line by the times polls close and, you know, what that time is, is, is different in different states, you know, usually eight, but whenever that time is, be in line at that time, stay in line and you have the right to vote, period. So, um, you know, that that's something that, you know, if you, if, if, if for some reason, you know, you're voting in person and you're running late to make sure you get there before the polls close. And even if there is a line at that time, um, you know, stay in that line. Okay. And so even if you cast your ballot, you know, after the time the, the polling location was scheduled to close, um, you, you, you have the right to do that. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And then another question, um, 
what does it mean to uh, sort of be a poll watcher? It's a term that um, came up in the debates. Um, I'm just curious if you could sort of explain what that entails and uh, what it requires and to what extent is it sort of related to those who are actually sort of working um, uh, at the polls? That's a, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so this, you know, this is one thing that also changes from state to state. So we see, uh, you know, we see different restrictions on who can kind of, you know, monitor or, you know, observe elections in states. So in some states, you know, anybody from any state can do it and they can go into the polling location and silently observe, right? And the laws are, you know, what they can wear, where they can stand, regulating all of that, who they can approach, who obviously they cannot talk to voters, you know, different things like that, right, are, um, are the rules in some states. Some states you have to be in that county in order to, you know, go into the polling location. You know, some states it's, uh, you know, different, you know, the different parties do different sort of poll watching and you have to be registered. So it's, it's the law on who, you know, who, who can enter a polling location is different from state to state where folks can stand. Um, and essentially it's observing to, you know, look how, see, see how our democracy is functioning. I think, you know, given the president's comments, we're all concerned with with what he thinks he's going to do you know with this law but bottom line is voter intimidation is illegal so when it reaches the level of something that is voter intimidation it's illegal you know i think we are all preparing for all scenarios here in in what that would look like on election day um and you know we we want to make sure that voters know that we have their backs right like we are preparing we this is you know what the mo this is it's truly this is there could not be a bigger civil rights difference between candidates right now and this is a incredibly important election and we want everybody to vote and we want to make sure that voters know we have their back and so we uh you know are part of the election protection coalition it's a nonpartisan group of of organizations that are able to give advice for voters. So if somebody has trouble casting a ballot, if there is something like, you know, um, you know, these instances can be very rare. And so I don't want to, you know, discourage anyone from voting. But if there is something, you know, know that somebody has your back. The number is eight six six R vote, and you know that that line is open now, and folks are able to advise. You know, there's boots on the ground kind of rapid response in different states. Also, um, you know, so whatever it is to, you know, to quash any sort of efforts that look nefarious, um, there's, there's a path to do that too. Okay, thank you. Um, I just got a question through another channel um, asking, this is from someone who is a voter in Wisconsin, what can and should we be doing to make sure that poll watchers don't actually intimidate voters? I know there have been, there have been cases where um, certain uh, folks are are protesting and creating perhaps a line to keep people from entering it's, uh, some of these polling places. And so what, what can we do um, if we're seeing that? If you are seeing that, you know, you absolutely call, you know, call election protection right away. And, you know, in, so we can take care of that, whether it's, you know, connecting with the folks in the state, the uh, you know, election administrators or um, whoever it is that we need to connect with, we will, or by dispatching folks to handle right away. So, you know, we, we want to make sure that we, you know, that we are, are having this balance of making sure that everybody knows what help is there, but also not, um, you know, there's a lot of doomsday scenarios happening right now in every way, right? In 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 poll monitors in what's the supreme court what if this goes you know to the supreme court we're hearing we're hearing every possible scenario right now um because of these just attacks that we're seeing from our president on our democracy and so you know as we think about these and all these hypotheticals you know the the only off ramp like the only exit valve here is if we all vote and so we need to all vote and so knowing that 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 is, you know, sharing information, making sure everybody votes and makes their plan to vote now is like the number one priority. And then also, you know, knowing that if, if anything happens, I mean, we could talk about any single hypothetical um, because, of, uh, because of the world that we're living in right now, um, but to know that help is available and that folks can call 866-R-VOTE and, you know, that this is being staffed around the clock. A lot of our, you know, state affiliates, uh, you know, across the country are the folks in that state who answer the phones, um, you know, in that particular state. So this is, you know, folks are ready um, for, for these instances. 
Uh, we just have um, a couple of minutes left, but I just want to thank you so much, Molly, for taking the time out of this really incredibly important work you're doing there um, in Wisconsin and on the ground and, you know, at the ACLU and your work in other states. Um, again, yes, thank you so much for educating us and letting us know sort of what next steps we can take to ensure the integrity of this election. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, attending, and um, I look forward to uh, voting, and I hope you all do as well. Thanks.